This is a 2020 Lincoln Corsair, and it's Lincoln's small luxury SUV. Now, I've already reviewed the Lincoln Navigator, Lincoln's large luxury SUV, and the Lincoln Aviator, one of their mid-size luxury SUVs, and I found them both to be truly impressive. Today, I'm going to find out if that Lincoln luxury SUV excellence translates to the Corsair. First, a little overview. Now, the Corsair is Lincoln's entry-level luxury SUV, like I said, and prices start around $37,000 with shipping. It's intended to compete with other small luxury crossovers like the Volvo XC60, the Acura RDX, the Lexus NX, and the Mercedes-Benz GLC. Unlike most small luxury SUVs, though, the Corsair isn't sporty. These days, all manufacturers of small luxury crossovers are trying to go sporty to cater to the active lifestyle crowd who wants their little crossover to go anywhere and zoom around. Lincoln thinks that there are still some buyers who want luxury with their luxury SUV, who want a more comfortable, refined, relaxed driving experience. And so Lincoln has catered to them, and the Corsair continues that tradition. But that's not to say that the Corsair isn't powerful. The base engine is a two-liter turbocharged four-cylinder that makes 250 horsepower. Or you can step up to a 2.3-liter turbocharged four-cylinder like this car. That makes 295 horsepower. And speaking of this car, this is a top-of-the-line reserve model, almost fully loaded with options, and that means it carries a sticker price of just under $60,000. And today, I'm going to find out if it's worth it. First, I'm going to take you on a tour of the Corsair, and I'm going to show you all of the quirks and features of the new baby Lincoln luxury SUV. Then, I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features of the Corsair with just getting in where there are a surprising amount of quirks. My very favorite is probably when you walk up to the car at night. If you have the key in your pocket, it senses your approach and the lights kind of light up gradually like you can see to let you know that you're walking up to your car. It is a very cool look and I really like it. One other cool thing at night when you approach the car, it projects the Lincoln emblem onto the ground in this field of white next to the car. More and more cars are doing this, but it kind of goes along with the front lighting and makes for a luxurious experience when you're walking up. And next up, another great feature in this car is right here on the driver's door, you can see there are some numbers on the side. That would be the keypad entry system. I've mentioned this in a few other Ford and Lincoln reviews, but it's worth going over quickly. This is a feature that allows you to lock your keys in the car, and then you can lock the door using a code you're given when you buy your Lincoln. The theory here is if you're going to go swim or go jogging, you don't want to take your car key with you, you can just stick your key in the car and you don't have to carry anything. It's a great idea. Only Ford and Lincoln use it. Nissan tried like 30 years ago, but then they stopped. I think it's a fantastic feature, and some people buy Fords and Lincolns solely on the basis of having the keypad entry system. And finally, the last cool quirk about getting into the Corsair, check this out. You unlock the doors and hold down the unlock button on the key fob, and all of the windows go down, and the sunroof will tilt up. And that provides a little ventilation, a little breeze into the interior before you climb in, which can be really nice if you live in a hot climate. Some other cars do this, but surprisingly few, and it's a good feature that I wish more cars would adopt. It's also worth noting you can do the same thing to close the windows. If you hold down the lock button after locking the doors, the windows close, which can be especially useful if you get out of the car and realize you accidentally left one window open. You don't have to get back in, turn it back on, roll it up. You just press your lock button and it will close. That is a good idea. And next up, moving inside the Corsair, the first thing you notice when you climb in here is that the interior quality is just 
fantastic. Look around this interior. It is a really beautiful place. It's not as nice as a BMW X7 or a Lincoln Navigator, some $100,000 high-end luxury SUVs, but for a compact luxury crossover, this is a truly fantastic interior. You can see this silver trim on the dashboard, very beautiful, looks really nice. It's right next to some very nice leather with stitching and all the other materials, everything you touch, everything you look at, very finely crafted for a compact luxury SUV. Now, one interesting item with the Corsair is the fact that this is a reserve model and that is the highest trim level. Other Lincoln SUVs I've reviewed have been the black label model, but there is no high-end black label trim for the Corsair. So this is as nice as it gets, which is kind of disappointing considering Lincoln has started to build a brand around the black label. But beyond just the appearance of this interior, let me give you a few examples of some of the luxury touches this car has that basically nothing else has in this segment. One is the seat adjustment. This car has 24-way power adjustable seats. Now you can see the seat adjuster on the door panel and you can do most of the usual stuff with a seat, move it backward, forward, up, down. You also have individual thigh supports here. So you can have your thighs supported at different places, basically, if you're on a long drive and your right leg is always extended because it's on the accelerator, but your left leg is back, you can have them supported in two different positions, which basically nobody else has. But like I mentioned, these are 24-way seats. You're wondering where all the other controls are. Well, if you press this button on the door panel, it pulls up the rest of your seat controls in the infotainment screen, and there are many, and you can configure the back and the bottom of the seat to kind of inflate or deflate basically anywhere on your body. These seats would be fantastic for someone who has back problems or who has trouble getting comfortable because you will find a comfortable position with these seats. The other impressive feature of these seats is a massage function, not just for the driver, but also for the front passenger. <laughs> I can't think of any other compact crossovers that offer a massaging seat, further proof of how Lincoln is targeting this for luxury-oriented people. Next up, another cool touch with this car is the buttons on the steering wheel, which light up or turn off based on what mode you're in. For example, cruise control is active right now. You can see all the cruise control buttons are lit up, but if I press the cruise control on-off button, they all turn off. And that way, you're not constantly being bombarded with buttons unless you're actually using them. And next up, another interesting quirk in this car is the fact that all of the warning chimes are luxurious. Take a listen to the chime that sounds when you get in, turn on the car, but you haven't buckled your seatbelt yet. And next up, take a listen to the chime that sounds when you're driving along without having buckled your seatbelt. And finally, here's my very favorite warning chime. This is the sound it makes when you put the car in drive, but your door is open. It's sort of a violin version of the first one. Now, most cars have very loud, obnoxious warning chimes, but I guess the theory here was they wanted it to be a more luxurious, more comfortable experience, and so, the chimes are also more luxurious. And next up, another nice touch in here is the climate control temperature display. Most automakers put the climate control temperature where you have it set in the infotainment screen and not anywhere else because it's just cheaper and easier for them to do it that way. But not Lincoln. You actually have individual screens in the center control stack that show what temperature you have the climate control set to. And each screen is not the old 1980s clock font displays that look terrible that some brands are still using. Instead, it's a nice luxurious display. But next up, the gear selector, because it's rather unusual. It's not a dial or a lever, but rather these buttons in the center control stack. You can see P, R, and D, and you press them to go into each gear. Not only does this look nice, but it also frees up a lot of space in the center console where a lever would be, and that allows for more storage, bigger cup holders, that sort of thing. And speaking of the center console, another interesting quirk in there is the drive mode dial, very large, right in the middle, and when you turn it, you can adjust the drive mode. Now, one interesting thing here is the pictures they use in the gauge cluster screen to 
explain each drive mode. For example, slippery is a slippery road, and deep conditions is like a wheel trudging through the snow. An eco is a picture of our beautiful planet. But when you're using pictures like that, the question becomes, what do you do for normal? And the answer is this little donut thing. <laughs> Can you imagine the meetings at Lincoln? Well, we're doing a planet for eco, so what do we do for normal? And then no one ever came up with anything, so that's what we've got. Next up, another interesting drive mode related item is the fact that they don't call sport mode sport in this car because that would be luxurious enough. Instead, it is called excite because it is exciting. And next up, another interesting quirk in this interior is over on the passenger side of the dashboard, you have a giant fake climate control vent in the middle. You can see there are two normal climate vents in the center of the dashboard and then another one over on the right. And in the middle of that, there's just a dummy climate vent. This is not a real vent. No air comes out of here. It's just for show. Now, the weirdest part about this is I'm seeing this in more and more cars. It seems that designers don't like this big empty space on the dashboard, so they try to make it look like one continuous climate vent, even though it isn't. This is one of the most bizarre new design trends, a fake climate vent for more interior design unity. And next up, another interesting quirk in here, back to the steering wheel. It's asymmetrical in a rather unusual way. On the left side of the wheel, by where you'd have your thumb, there is a button that turns on the voice control. So if you want to say something to the car instead of trying to find the button for it, that's how you activate it. Over on the right side, there is no such button. There's only one voice control button and they put on the left by where your thumb would be to make it as easy as possible to use voice control without taking your hands off the wheel. And next up, another interesting item. In this car's center control stack, between the climate vents, you have a button marked P with two lines on it. This button turns on this car's automated parking system. This car will automatically park for you in a traditional perpendicular spot or a parallel spot. And I have to say, I've used a lot of these automated parking systems over the years. This is one of the best. I parked it in a very small spot in front of my house the other day, and it did perfectly. It found the spot, it backed itself in, it did the pedals, the steering wheel, everything. But anyway, speaking of the infotainment system, there are a couple of interesting quirks and features in here. And I want to start with the cruise control settings. You go into the cruise settings, you can see there's a choice between normal, adaptive, or intelligent. Normal's regular cruise control. Adaptive will speed up and slow down to the car in front of you. Intelligent will read the road signs around you and then speed up or slow down based on those road signs. So if you're driving in a 55 zone and it goes down to 40, the car will actually slow down to 40 on its own because it has automatically read the road sign. And here's the other cool thing, you can adjust the car's tolerance to the speed limit. So if you always wanna be going 10 miles an hour over the limit, you can set that and the car will always be going 10 over even when the speed limit changes. That is pretty impressive. And next up, another interesting item in the infotainment system, go into wiper settings and you can configure a courtesy wipe, which sounds like the kind of childish humor your seventh grader would bring home from middle school, but it is an actual thing. Basically, when you wash the windshield with washer fluid, you can configure whether or not it will then wipe again, like eight seconds later, to clear up any remaining fluid. Some people like that, some people don't. In this car, it's configurable as the courtesy wipe. And one other interesting item in the infotainment system, going along with this car's luxurious persona, if you press this little button in the center control stack, you can turn on what Lincoln calls the calm screen. You can change the infotainment screen from displaying all of its stuff to just showing you the time and date. If you press that button again, you can turn the screen completely off. Now, as for the infotainment system itself, I find it to be pretty good. The screen is relatively small for a new luxury car infotainment screen, but other than that, it is an excellent system. You can go through all the menus, very quick to respond to your touch, nothing particularly surprising or bad in this screen. Next, we move on to the gauge cluster screen in this car. And I've already shown you this a little bit, but there are a few other items worth noting. One is the extra screen. You can use it to show your trip odometer data, your tire pressures, or once again, 
you can have the calm screen turn on in case you just don't want to be bombarded with information and want a dark screen next to your speedometer. And next up, another interesting item in the gauge cluster. If you go into settings, you can turn on something called Eco Coach. And from there, you can configure two different items. One is something called Eco Advices, which I think provides you advice on how to drive more efficiently if you aren't. But my favorite is Coasting Support. If you turn this on, the car will actually tell you how much fuel you've saved by coasting. It'll provide you support, like it's cheering you on to coast because it is your eco coach. That is a pretty good idea, and it probably helps people drive more efficiently when they see their coach providing support from the sidelines of the gauge cluster. And next up, we move on to the back seat in the Corsair. Not a lot worth covering back here, but a few notable items. One is the fact that the materials in back are not as nice as they are in front. That silver aluminum trim on the dashboard, gone. You don't have it back here. And the rear seat backs are kind of crappy. They look like plastic, not an especially nice look back here. It certainly isn't as luxurious in the back as it is in the front. Now, that isn't all that surprising to me, since this is the back seat and the focus of a luxury compact crossover is usually on the front seat occupants, but I am disappointed by rear seat legroom back here. I have the front driver's seat positioned where I would sit, and you can see my knees are kind of digging into the front seat. I recently reviewed the new Ford Escape, and like I mentioned, the Corsair is based on the Escape, and I really feel like I had more rear seat room in the Escape. And I wonder if the reason for that is, in order to create these 24-way front seats that can do anything and go anywhere, they just had to make them thicker, and that kind of cuts down on rear seat legroom, but it definitely is a little tight back here. Pretty common for a compact crossover, but tighter than I expected. With that said, you do have one nice luxury back here, heated rear seats, little buttons on the back of the center console, you turn them on, and then your rear seat is heating. And next up, we move on to the cargo area of the Corsair. One interesting quirk is just getting in. The button to pop open the tailgate is not right in the middle because that's where the backup camera is. Instead, it's kind of hidden over off to the side. Obviously, you would get used to this. It's not really a problem, but it is interesting. Or if you want to open the tailgate, you can just do one of these, kick your foot under the bumper with the key in your pocket, and it opens right up. A lot of cars offer this feature, but this is the most consistent consistent I have ever seen. Usually they work kind of sporadically. This one works all the time. And next up on the subject of the cargo area, nothing particularly interesting in here. It is a cargo area, not especially huge, about normal for this segment in terms of size. With that said, it does have one feature which is really nice. There are these little buttons over on the side of the cargo area that say L and R. You push those and you can drop the left and right back seats. That allows you to increase the size of the cargo area literally with the push of a button button, and it's uncommon in this size class. Most larger luxury SUVs offer it, but not too many compact luxury SUVs do, but the Corsair does. And next up, one other really interesting car geeky item back here that's worth noting. You probably noticed a minute ago when I put up the tailgate, the brake lights go up with it. And I have always said in my videos that the US government has a regulation saying that brake lights cannot be on a movable piece of bodywork because then if that piece is moved, you won't be able to see the brake lights. So how does Lincoln get away with it? Well, check this out. You can see the turn signals are on right now. The hazard lights. And you can also see there is another lighting element down here in the bumper. When I open the tailgate, watch down here. Instantly, the turn signals switch and now they've turned on down here in the bumper. Now, this is also true of the brake lights. If you were to have the brake lights on and open the tailgate, they would immediately switch to being on down here in the bumper. And so the way that Lincoln is able to get around this regulation is by having two sets of brake lights and turn signals. Now, when you go to close the tailgate, you can see what happens. The turn signals are still on in the bumper, but the moment the tailgate closes, they turn right back on on the tailgate because that's the normal set. The auxiliary set is only used when the tailgate is open. And next up, another important Corsair point worth noting while I'm out here, I really like how this car looks. I don't think it's as beautiful as the new Aviator or the new Navigator, but I like the simple restrained styling. So many automakers are so desperately trying to court sporty new young buyers that the cars are just trying too hard. <laughs> Lincoln is still doing sort of the restrained, simple look. And for people who don't want their cars to be so shouty and crazy, 
This is a great choice. One other thing I like is the fact that it actually says the model name of the car on the front fender, or in this case, the front door on new Lincolns. That's actually surprisingly helpful. And I wish Mercedes-Benz would do it because maybe then I could tell apart a C-Class and an E-Class when I see them on the road. And next up, we move under the hood in the Corsair. Like I mentioned, there are two engine choices. The base model has a two liter turbo four with 250 horsepower, or you can step up to this at 2.3 liter turbo four with 295 horsepower. Nothing especially unusual or quirky with any of that. It roughly mimics the power output and engine size in the Volvo XC60 and the Lexus NX, which are two of this car's closest competitors. And so those are the quirks and features of the new 2020 Lincoln Corsair. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the Corsair. Now, one thing I want to make clear here, uh, just by targeting luxury buyers, it doesn't necessarily mean Lincoln is targeting old people. I know a lot of people who are interested in like a luxury crossover who have no interest in getting a sporty, crazy looking thing, and they just want something nice and comfortable and relaxing. Lincoln has managed to make luxury kind of seem younger than you'd think uh, by leading with the Navigator and making the cool one first and then having it trickle down to cars like the Corsair. Right, I'm gonna floor it here. Whoa. Whoa, that is surprising. I was not expecting that from 295 horsepower. This engine, this 2.3 liter turbo four that Ford has is such a potent engine. They use it in the Ranger too. And I think this is one of the best engines, certainly the best four cylinder on the market right now. Just a really excellent powertrain. The thing that has impressed me driving around in this car is the uh, the comfort and the luxury and the ride quality and the interior quality and that sort of thing. This car is certainly not sporty. Uh, there is an excite mode. This car is pretty quick, obviously but it isn't sporty. The handling is relatively slow. Um, it's, it's a luxury very much at the forefront and the focus. When you are accelerating, you do hear more engine than I would expect from a vehicle that it's focused on luxury. But at idle, sitting at a stoplight, it is like isolation, which you never get in a compact crossover. I also love the interior material. Sitting in here and look at this, I have driven all of the compact crossovers, uh, the luxury ones, and to me, this has the nicest interior materials. The one that I think is close and is really worth a close comparison is the Volvo XC60. Um, to me, Volvo and Lincoln have both kind of pursued luxury and technology instead of sporty. They've gone for more restrained styling, and the result is you get nice looking cars, good tech, comfortable, and those are two that are pretty close. And I think the Volvo's interior is also pretty nice. And I think Volvo actually has better technology than Lincoln. Bigger screen, better cameras, um, that sort of thing. Adaptive Cruise works great, brings the car all the way to a stop. You do have to tap a button to get it started again once it's hit zero for a few seconds, but that's not that big of a deal. The auto steering feature also did very well. Kept the car in the center of the lane, didn't start to drift out, no real concerns. Um, there were a couple times when I went by an exit when it started to kind of go in that direction rather than stay straight on the road. You do have to tap the steering wheel fairly frequently every five or eight seconds or something, um, but that's standard in all cars now. So the adaptive cruise and auto steering system in this vehicle, surprisingly excellent, very usable, especially at low speeds. And so that's the Lincoln Corsair. This is an excellent small luxury SUV, and given the level of equipment and the refinement and the comfort, this is probably the small luxury SUV to get if your priority really is luxury. This is essentially a baby Lincoln Navigator, and I'm really impressed with it. And now it's time to give the Corsair a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, I really like the look of the Corsair for a compact crossover, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Acceleration does 0 to 60 in 6 and a half seconds, and it gets a 3 out of 10. Handling is normal for this segment, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Fun factor is also normal for a small luxury crossover, which is to say fairly low, and it gets a 2 out of 10. Finally, cool factor, and this is cool in the sense that it's new and from a premium brand, but there's not much more to it, and it gets a 3 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 18 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. The Corsair has a lot of equipment, including some great self-driving tech, and it gets an 8 out of 10. Comfort, the Corsair is luxurious and smooth, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Quality is good. The materials are great in front, but less so in back, and reliability is a bit of a question mark, so it gets a 7 out of 10. Practicality is normal for this segment, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Finally, value, and this is a good one. It doesn't have the brand name of Lexus or Audi or Mercedes, but it's good tech and a luxurious 
car with competitive pricing, and it gets a 7 out of 10 for a total daily score of 36 out of 50. Add it up and the Doug score is 54 out of 100, which places it here against other compact and subcompact luxury crossovers and against the Lincoln Navigator and Aviator. The Corsair is highly competitive, and I really think it's worth a close look if you're shopping for a small luxury crossover, unless you prefer sharper styling and a sportier focus. Ah!